Hello, Emma. Thank you for joining me today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have this conversation because you and I have spent a bit of time offline and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put a microphone in front of your face and um, (laughs) get all of this so that other people can listen to us. Fine. Well, I hope it's interesting for the listeners to see what happens. Well, I've found it currently and previously very exciting listening to your story. So do you want to kick us off and tell us who you are and where you're from and where you're based now? Sure. Uh, my name is Emma. I am currently in Singapore. I've been in Singapore for six and a half years. Uh, before that, I was in Hong Kong for nearly 13 and originally from Australia. So I've been in Asia nearly 20 years. Um I left school at the age of 15, so I'm an uneducated entrepreneur um, and I've seemed to be doing all right so far in the last 30 years. Um, I started my first company when I was 16. I started a recruitment business and I sold that at the age of 22. Uh, And then since then, I kind of got the the bug. It's kind of getting the traveling bug. I got the entrepreneurial bug and uh, went on and started several other businesses. So I'm currently on my 12th business, I think uh and uh and yeah 12 business is going strong so i've got a at the moment i'm selling alcohol free drinks uh alcohol free beer wine and spirits uh in singapore and looking to expand uh in a couple more countries in asia over the next couple of years if not partner with someone bigger and maybe even sell out who knows it's uh trying to educate people on alcohol free and telling people that it's not a taboo taboo kind of word and it shouldn't be shamed if you don't want to have a drink uh and things like that so yeah Love it. That's I'm me. very, I'm very, um, I'm very interested to sort of talk about how the your entrepreneurial mindset and spirit, as people say, has um, sort of played a really interesting role in your in your trailing spouse experience as well. So, do you want to talk about the the move from Oz to Hong Kong and how that came about and mm-hmm. What was your husband doing and what, what did that all sort of look like? And give us a sort of timeline on that. Sure. So I was 28. So we were, we were married quite young. So I was 22 when I got married. Uh, so we've been married a few years, happy days. And then he got offered a promotion. He works in logistics to move to Hong Kong uh, to run. He's a finance, finance controller to run the Asia. Uh, Asia from Hong Kong. So we thought, why not? Uh, and that's very much my mindset when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's like, why not have a go? Uh, if it doesn't work, you can always leave. So we thought we'll go over for a couple of years. Uh, I was kind of crapping myself a little bit because I didn't have an education. I didn't. I don't have a degree in anything. I didn't know how to get a job, kind of. But it wasn't too bad because in those days, uh, as a trailing spouse in Hong Kong, you didn't get a dependent visa. So I couldn't work. So it wasn't a bad thing. So we went over there. I was 28, couldn't work. Uh, he went to work every day. And I found myself going from working hardcore, you know, 16-hour days to nothing, to watching Oprah in the morning. And uh, and it was really weird. So I thought, okay, I can't stay in bed. So my life at the beginning was waking up when he woke up, send him off to work, and then I'd go to the gym, keep myself busy in the day, going shopping, uh, look, checking out the local 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 shops and stuff. And then I was kind of sitting by the kitchen waiting to cook and waiting for him to walk in the door. And I'm like, is this my life now for the next couple of years? And and it was always around his pattern. I'd, I'd, I'd walk down to his office and wait for wait for him to finish and then walk home with him and didn't really have much of a life. And I felt a little bit lost um, and a little bit unimportant, I guess. Um, and I needed something to do. So, and I couldn't work uh, and I didn't want to go back to Australia. I wanted to stick it out and give it a couple of years. Um, couldn't start a business, did, had no idea about Asia at that time. So I thought, okay, well, we've got to do something. Um, so I'm not ready to have kids yet. So uh, I thought uh, I'll go and get myself a job without getting paid, I guess. So I used to be a professional squash player. So I played a lot of squash and I'm a qualified squash coach. So I went to some of the local clubs, clubs and did some coaching and did some playing. Uh, and then I decided to learn Cantonese. So I went and put myself into a Cantonese course. So I'd go every day, five days a week, 10 to 12. Um, so the first hour was learning some words. And then the second hour, some Chinese lady would come in and not speak a word of English. And you just sit there and look at the other people in the room going, what the hell is she talking about? Um, but that worked out to be the best hour in the whole class eventually, because that's where you actually learn how to speak Cantonese um, with someone just speaking to you. 
Uh, so that was quite cool. So then instead of getting up and waiting for my husband and waiting to cook a meal, uh, I went and did stuff. Uh, but it took a little bit of guts to go and do it. And so I learned Cantonese for about a year and a half, met some great friends, and then got my own social social scene going. Uh, so then got to play sport, got to play golf, got to do other things. So it was it was a bit hard at first, but I guess I'm always a bit of a go-getter personality-wise, so I'm not afraid to talk to anyone. Um, but it was it was interesting. It'd be hard to it, it would be hard for someone to be a trailing spouse if they're they they are a bit of an introvert and aren't uh, comfortable talking to people. Uh, but in my case, I can probably talk to anyone and talk underwater. So um, yeah, it was quite interesting. So yeah, so my my initial experience was waiting around, and then after I snapped out of it it took a couple of months um i got off my butt and got out and did something to educate myself to live in the environment that i was in how's your cantonese seal seal gong 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 it's not too bad that's good have you been able to sort of continue on like have you actively tried to continue on with it like not going to the explicit sort of five days a week lessons but have you actively seeked out other Cantonese speakers yeah. to try and keep it going? Actually, not in Singapore, no. Um, but it was it was quite cool. Maybe a year or so ago, I was down at a wet market, at like a hawker centre, having a, just chicken rice or something, and there was a little kid playing, and, and the little kid said something in Cantonese, and then the grandfather walked over and started speaking Cantonese, and I spoke back to him saying, oh, that's okay, because he thought the kid was bothering me, and I spoke back saying, no, the kid's not bothering me and stuff. And then he's just looking at me. And then his daughter walked over, who's speaking English, and said, oh, my God, my dad doesn't speak any English, and you're speaking Cantonese to him. It's so cool. So that was quite quite fun. Uh, yeah. So it is it is cool, and it's good to be able to listen in on conversations uh, so I can understand more than I can speak. So I can understand when people are talking about me and what they're saying about me. So that's coming in handy sometimes. And then I talk back to them, and they kind of <laughs> get a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> so it's been quite good. Quite fun. I, I love that. I feel that's like a superpower of um, yeah. of language, particularly when you yeah. don't look like the people that are speaking the language, yeah. and then you uh, can yeah. can surprise them like that. I love that. It's so cool. So cool. Well, that yeah, would have I had um... uh, an incident. <laughs> Sorry, you go. I had an incident while I was playing squash, and there was a, I was in the men's team, and uh, and all the men came, and I was the number one player in the team, and all the guys were talking, saying. To the number one player, oh, don't worry, it's, a, it's just a girl, you'll be fine. And they're saying girls are always rubbish and girls are crap and this girl, you know, she's a little bit fat, she'll be fine. Uh, and then and then I – so normally – it was a division below where I would normally play. So I, normally I'd just give them a run and then beat them. But this time I was like, okay, I'm really going to beat you now. So I beat him like 11 nil, 11 nil, 11 nil. Or something. And then I walked off and in Cantonese I went, yeah, just a girl, a little bit fat. Do you want to be her? <laughs> And then they're all just looking at each other and went, oh, no, 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 we've got to go. <laughs> so that was the, the best case in these experience. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's like I, I'm so impressed with your, like, patience to be able to do that out. I am way too <laughs> short-fused that would have just snapped back. Like, I can actually yeah. understand yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just, just, just patience, just patience. Oh, yeah, that's good. so good. good. That's so good. So talk me um talk me through what once you said you sort of like um snapped out of it, I think it was the words you used. Yeah. Like what did um what did that sort of new friendship circle or network that you started mm-hmm. building in in Hong Kong sort of look like? Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't so I couldn't work, so I didn't have work friends. So uh a lot of my core friends were probably from Cantonese school, uh and sport. Uh, I've been lucky enough that because I play a high level of sport, so a decent level of sport. So I could walk into most places and just play sport, and that's an instant friend circle. So majority of my friends were probably through sport um, and a couple through my husband's work and then a couple through Cantonese class. But majority, majority sport, yeah. Even a little bit fat, but still look at all your friends. Yeah, still can run around. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't matter how fat you are if you can play properly. <laughs> oh, funny. Well, um, talk me through then because obviously something, because I, I know bits of your story, obviously something sort of shifted in Hong Kong and your ability to sort of change how things were happening sort of work-wise and business-wise and things. Sort of mm. talk me through how you transitioned from uh, 
living best sport and Cantonese life mm. to um, actually getting back stuck in on the work side of things. Yeah, so they, they changed the rules. So they changed the rules for dependents that you could work without a visa. So that was a big change. That was a big shift because a lot of travelling spouses back then wanted to work but couldn't work. So most of us that were going to can- Cantonese school and playing sport all day, then when that visa, the visa situation changed, most of us did go and get work. Um, so what, what year was so, that? So I would have been about 30. So it was two years in, so maybe 2008. Um, yeah, about 2008, 2000, yeah, 2008. So 2008, I thought, okay, cool, I can legally work. Um, I started out just as a squash coach. I, I got a coaching job at the American Club and Football Club, uh, and so I did some coaching for a while. But then uh, we thought about having kids, and then I got pregnant. I didn't really want to do coaching. So uh, I wanted to, So I say to some people, I kind of invented the first, first Facebook. So pre before everyone was on Facebook, uh, I thought when we moved to Hong Kong, I wanted people back home, my relatives back home, to see photos of the kids, like photos of us, and I wanted to see photos of my nieces and nephews. So so I, I just thought I'll build a website and then we can share photos on this website, so a photo sharing page. Uh, and I said to all my brothers and sisters and, and cousins and stuff, I said, send me some photos and I'll put them all up so we can all see what each other's kids look like. And I didn't have kids at this stage, so but I didn't know how to do a website. So I got I bought a book, <laughs> as you do. So like websites for dummies or something. And so I was going through this book, and I'm like, actually, it's not that hard. Uh, so I'm quite good with common sense. Uh, and so, so I thought, okay, you just got to do X X X, and boom, you got a website. Um, so I set up a website and did some photo sharing. And then I was speaking to a friend of mine's husband, who's a is a full on geeky IT guy who's the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Um, and I said to him, look, I think this is really cool. I said, I can set up websites. Uh, you know, do you think there's some kind of a job for this? And he goes, oh, my God, in Hong Kong, they're charging a fortune for really crappy websites. And I, I knew this because some people said to me, oh, I've seen your photo site. Can you help me out? And they said they've been charged like 20 grand to set up a website. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I did it in three days. So I'm thinking, okay, if they're charging 20 grand, I could did it in three days. I'll charge you five grand uh, and I'll do it for you. So then I started to do just a couple of friend sites and setting up some websites. And then I got some charities that asked me to set up sites because I was doing some charity support and charity work and um, and some sporting websites. So I set up a couple of golf websites, a couple of tennis websites, some netball websites because I knew people in sport. So then I started setting up all these websites for people. And I'm like, okay, this is actually a business. So we're going back to my entrepreneurial days. And now I can legally work. Let's do it. So I set up an IT company. And then I ended up getting a contract to set up someone's, uh, I used to do wireless networking. So set up wireless networks, set up full office systems and servers and things like this. So it went from starting a like a semi Facebooky kind of site, just to share photos of nieces and nephews into a full blown IT uh it system it website uh, it company so that yeah so it's kind of and that's how i got back into work i just fell into it a little bit um i think because you're not, not afraid to have a go so i just you know anytime i see an opportunity I just pick it up and then i could legally work so i started again and that was it that was the first time, first business in hong kong was it i I'm interested to sort of hear it's a little bit of a, a side track from from your story, but the other the other people that you were at Cantonese school with, when it sort of just opened up, mm. was it a free for all? Like was mm. it what and, and you could just yeah. roll in and get a job, you could apply in a corporate, yep. you could apply in a small business, McDonald's, anyway. wherever you yep. wanted, you could go and work. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so one became a preschool teacher, like a teacher assistant. Uh one what did Michelle do? One was in fashion. She started doing her own design work and selling fashion. So she started a side hustle. Um, and one moved back to America. And a couple couple didn't get jobs. A couple started having kids because we couldn't work. So because it, it was that, you know, these this friend circle was the 26 to 35-year-old friend circle. So a couple of them started having kids. So the ones that didn't have kids, yeah, a couple of preschool teachers, a couple of started speak, um, teaching English as a second language. Um, so that was quite a good one because those jobs were paying quite quite good. So you can go into a school and work as an English teacher with 
no qualification basically um, as a teacher assistant. So that was the easiest walk-in jobs for most expats back in Hong Kong in those days. How interesting. Okay, so yeah. how did um how did an IT company evolve <laughs> into what happened next? <laughs> so I had IT company for a while and then I worked out, so with the IT company, I worked out I was building myself a job rather than building a business. So, because I was the one doing the work. And I remember I had my second kid, uh, yeah, I think it was my second kid, and I still had the, the IT company. Yeah, second kid. And I was in hospital the day I gave birth with someone on the telephone ringing me saying something's not working on my website and thinking in my head, I've just given birth and someone's asking me to fix their website to change your color from blue to red or something. And I'm like, this is not my life. Uh, I don't want to build myself a job. I want to build a business where, you know, I have other people doing this. So it was, a, so I came to the point where either I expand and hire, hire people, developers and things, uh, or I close or sell or do something else. Uh, so I decided just to, to tone it down, to cut back on customers. I just kept some charity work and did some sports websites um, myself and then gave away everything else. Uh, so I ended up closing that. I didn't sell that one. And then I thought, uh, and then I thought I just got bored. Every time I get bored, I start a new business. So, or every time I have a conversation with someone like yourself, I start a new business. So, I uh, I was I was talking to someone, and then my second, my next business, uh, I had a friend of mine who had the distribution rights for a, uh, an Australian sim- swimwear business, a swimwear company manufacturer called Funkita and fun, um, Funkita and Funky Trunks, and uh, it was really cool, cool swimmers. And she had a lot of excess stock. And she wanted to move it. So I thought, okay, we'll do this. So I had some friends of mine who had a swim company. So we decided to go in together and we we started a swimwear business where we sold all her excess stock. So we just, so my IT background came in. So I just set up a website overnight. They knew everyone in swimming. So I was like, perfect. There's my, my target market. Um, and the two of us just sold a hell of a lot of swimwear. Um, so we did that for about six, six to 12 months. Uh, and then that died down because the stock ran out. So it was all, we got the stock on consignment. So it was good, no overheads. Uh, and then I uh, got an idea for a flower business, which didn't get off the ground. We registered it, but didn't even open it. It was like a, we had big plans to sell this like like flower carrier kind of thing to, to Roses R Us in Australia and all around the world and didn't get off the ground. Uh, but that's okay. That happens in business. And then, then I met a farmer, and then I met a farmer, and uh, back in those days, well, we're talking maybe what ten years ago now. Uh, you know, meat in the meat quality in Hong Kong wasn't great, so you go to the supermarket, a couple of butchers, but they were charging a fortune for frozen meat, and it wasn't the best quality. So, and there was definitely no Australian sausages or anything like that. And this farmer wanted to do something in Hong Kong. She was already distributing in Hong Kong, so I thought, okay, this is cool. Like I eat meat, I could sell meat. So I thought, let's sell meat. So I said, I can set up a website and sell anything. So I set up a website and then she had the meat. I had the website. We went into business uh, and then we started a meat business. So we started an online uh, butchery uh, and it went really well. Uh, she, We ended up parting ways. It didn't, the business relationship didn't work. Um, so I had to walk away from the business and this is something that happens in business. Uh, so I walked away with nothing and started an, a new butchery myself. I uh, just had different different ideas of how business works. Uh, she was a lot younger than me. Uh, and then I started Farmer's Market, and that was a very successful, successful uh, online butcher in Hong Kong. And then when I moved to Singapore, I started in Singapore as well. And then since... Since then, I've sold both of those businesses. Uh, so that was good. It's good to be able to sell a business. Uh, and then I've started an alcohol-free business now. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And I've invested in a couple of other small businesses. But so I don't have to run them. So it's good. <laughs> okay, so for anyone else that's listening that's not exhausted, well done. You're obviously uh, far, <laughs> far more mentally fit than I was. And this is, and people will agree with me. This is why I was really interested to put a microphone in front of me because it is hilarious, like the, the jumping around and, but I think also like the fact that like some of them didn't work and some of the things fell over and some things went sour and, and you sort of are like, but it's, it's in you. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you, yeah, you've got to have a go. But yeah, some things do fail, and and people, especially these days, people think they'll just start a business and they'll make money. Especially e-commerce. E-commerce. Everyone in COVID thought I'll start an e-commerce business as a stay-at-home trailing spouse, and it'll be easy. You know, it's it's easy to start a business, but it's it is it's easy to set up a website. It's not easy to get conversions. Uh, yeah. And then if you're in partnership with someone, it can go way south. Yeah. I think that that's it. It's really easy to start a business. Like you can you can start a business, no problem. Like mm. making a sale is tricky. <laughs> exactly. Trying to get to your target audience. Mm. Who's going to look at websites these days? It's all social media. Mm. So now, I mean, the trend these days is changing again. So as a trailing spouse, I mean, I'm still a trailing spouse. So, uh, you know, I have to either work in the business that I own or I can't work. So... So it's still a bit, it's still very restrictive. So I'm constantly thinking of new businesses to make. And I mean, the new trend is definitely social media. So no one sets up websites these days. Uh, It's all social media. So it's all, how much do you know about Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok, Snapchat? Um, And that's where websites aren't going to sell these days. TikTok sells, um, depending on your market or Facebook sells or Instagram sells. Um, the website is just a transaction page, so it's a it's a it's a whole new world in the next five years. So I'm trying to get my head around it to get some more business ideas. <laughs> I don't think you'll ever have a shortage slash problem of getting the business <laughs> ideas, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just gonna get it going. Tell me, um, tell me what sort of what age and stage and dates and things that that move from Hong Kong to Singapore happened and what sort of triggered that Mm -hmm. and how did you sort of find I'm really I'm always really interested to hear the you know the differences that people find moving between places especially in a similar sort of region because I think like Mm -hmm. I know an Australian default puts Asia together you know you're in Asia with a very um I guess, sort of restricted view on how different the, like, there is, how many yeah. countries here? There's like 60 <laughs> countries or something in Asia. Like, and completely crazy. different. 100%. Yeah. And, so so yeah. tell me tell me about that, the move, the Hong Kong to Singapore yeah. move. Yeah, so, so what year, so six and a half years ago, so 2016-ish, I think. Um, so my husband got off, uh, in his role, he's had a new boss and his boss was based in Singapore. Uh, so he wanted my husband to sit next to him in Singapore. So like, okay. And at that time, business was going really well for me. So I'm like, I don't really want to go to Singapore. Um, my my eldest kid was finishing year six, at, so finishing primary school. So it was, it was a good time for him to convert uh, to, to another school, to go to high school. So the timing for that was quite good. But I still didn't want to move. <laughs> um, and And I'd heard Singapore was boring and it was hot all the year and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, you know what, he has to go. And he's he's probably enabling me to be an entrepreneur. So, you know, if I don't have work, he's still got his paycheck coming in. So it's not, not the worst thing. So we need his job. So it was a no-brainer that we had to move. So, so we moved. Um, and at first it was awesome. It was like a holiday. You know, you go to Bali or whatever. It's, it, your first month is easy, cruising, meet some new friends. So I've started playing sport. So I had to go. And I hadn't been playing a lot of sports. So I had to go get fit again to go back to sport, to join clubs, to, to play a high level of competition sport, uh, to make some friends. So that was the only way I knew how to make friends. Um, that will, and they don't, they speak English in Singapore, so couldn't get a language school. Um, so just so yeah, a side and- note, just a side note there. Also very unfit, slow fat people like myself can also make <laughs> friends through sports. So anyone listening to this, don't feel that Again. the only way to make friends in sport is when you've been in like a top 100 globally <laughs> no, group no, you of can, sports you can. people. But you don't know how competitive I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, the there. that's the key point there. That's the key point Extremely competitive, yes. Uh, so, yeah, super competitive. Um, and back then... I could work in Singapore. So when I moved here, you had an LOC. So I could get an LOC and work anywhere. And, and it didn't have to be on a minimum. So I could work in a bar for 500 bucks if I wanted. Um, so back in the old days, it was awesome. So mm. I had an LOC to work. So I started my, my butchery business here. And then I was flying back and forward to Hong Kong 
and I on purpose didn't network business wise in Singapore because I I just started the the Singapore butchery just to have a base and just to say that I'm global like I'm the biggest butcher in Asia and that was my 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 tagline because no one else had dual countries so I was like no one can say I'm wrong because I'm the biggest okay <laughs> so so it's more of an advertising ploy so I was just I had a couple bit of sales here and but I was going back and forward to Hong Kong for the first two years uh pre-COVID and I didn't want to make friends in business I avoided networking avoided everything which is good and bad and then COVID came and then I couldn't go back to Hong Kong so instead of going back every month I was here relying on my staff in Hong Kong to run the business for the next two and a half years and that was really hard and then in that two and a half years they cancelled the LSE in Singapore so now I'm stuck in Singapore I've got no no, not able to work my own business. So I have to go and either get an EP or close the business or sell the business. So I had to get someone else to run the business and then eventually sold the business. Um, but the rules changed and it, and it really threw a spanner in the works. Uh, I knew Hong Kong. I knew people in Hong Kong. I knew how to collaborate in Hong Kong. And then because I'd pulled myself away from Singapore when I moved here and I purposely avoided networking and collaborating in Singapore, kind of, did myself a, you know, a wrong because then I had no one to work with. Um, so it was, it was unusual for me not to have a big network. Uh, and then obviously I had to change that real quick. So through, through sport, I had my social friends, but then I had to go back out to the workforce and back out to the to networking. And then during COVID to do that it was near impossible. So I'm on a million Zooms, I'm on podcasts, I'm doing everything I can for people to get to know who I am. Uh, and then eventually got a reputation that, oh, do you know, Emma, she's a good networker, blah, blah, blah. And then it won't network again. But it was super hard because rules can, rules in Asia can change. And you're saying like country to country, rules can change so quickly that you might think you're settled in a country and then you lose your job. You lose your LOC. You lose your power to work. Uh, and it really changes people's li- livelihoods. And, and especially as a traveling spouse, you go from, being independent and getting up, getting the kids on the bus, going to work, networking, building a business to someone saying, well, you can't do that anymore uh, unless you earn X amount and go get an EP and jump through hoops. Uh, so it's, it's been difficult, it's been difficult. So, yeah, so I'm now working on other businesses to try and keep LOCs and keep EPs and things like that. So uh, it's it's different. I just want to do a quick abbreviation of terms there. Um, so an LOC that Emma's referring to is a letter of consent, which is um, the Singaporean mm. government giving you permission to work. And so that used to be just a given and now it's a lot more hoop jumping, as you mentioned. And then an EP is an employment yeah. pass where some, a company has sponsored you. I think for the people that are living, uh, that are listening outside of Singapore um, in different parts of the world find it fascinating just the challenges that are sort of faced but I think what we're finding like globally the restrictions around non-residents are definitely getting stricter as far Mm. as access to things as people countries become more nationalistic and you know their residents first and things like you can see how it happens but I can't even because it was an overnight thing, wasn't it? Like it yeah. literally, they they turned it off overnight. Just, like, yeah. Talk me through because you were here in the guts of that time. Like, talk me through sort of some of the other, I guess, industries. Like I've heard stories about, say, like the international schools, because a huge number mm. of trailing spouses that were on letters of consent from the government yeah. worked as teachers and teachers' aides and things, and their staff were cut like in half overnight. Like. Forty percent of teachers lost their jobs. Uh, yeah, over the summer holidays, they they just couldn't come back to work. Uh, and the government realised that because the education, the international education schools um, went to went to the government and said, "This is ridiculous. We're going to lose forty percent of our staff. The family's already here." When because the whole change of the letter of consent was because they wanted to give more locals jobs. They thought expats. They thought expats were taking locals jobs. But these international schools, the locals couldn't do those jobs. It was either, you know, a, a, a language teacher or a specialist teacher in an international school doing IB curriculum or A-level curriculum or something that, you know, they needed that staff member. And their family was already here as the main person being a teacher. So they, I think they rallied and they got the approval for 
LOCs for education, uh, so like an equivalent. So they got employment passes for education at a lower rate than what what we're at now. So if I wanted to go get an employment pass, I think I need to be paid at least ten ten thousand dollars a month. Whereas I think the education they lowered it to maybe four. So you could be a teacher's assistant on a on a different kind of pass. So they created a new pass. Um, but yeah, it took them a while. But it took. I mean, the government soon realized that 40% of teachers were going to disappear and all international schools were going to be in chaos. Um, So they changed the rule within a month, within a couple of weeks or a month. So that was quite good. But then the biggest effect, especially talking about trailing spouses, right? So you get, you go to any any Asian country and you can start a business easy. Like we're saying, you know, you set up a website, you want to make bracelets, you want to make hair things, whatever. And you've got a hobby we call I call it a hobby business, right? You, you're making yourself a business. I did it with websites, right? You make yourself a business, you make yourself a job um, and you do that job. So mine was service, but some people have product. Um, so you've got a one man band, making bracelets, going to markets, selling at markets, things like that. All of those people disappeared because they were all on LOCs because all of their either husbands, boyfriends, wives, girlfriends had jobs and then they were a dependent on that person. So they had an LOC to work making bracelets and selling at markets. And then overnight, they all lost it. So all those um, boutique, hobby, market kind of people just disappeared. And then proper corporates came in. It took about a year before, a year or maybe even two years after COVID, well, definitely uh, maybe more, uh, before those people came back and started applying for LO, um, employment passes um, and different ways to get jobs. But a lot of those companies just disappeared. So you, you don't have that boutiqueness in the expat in the expat um, circle anymore. So there's no there's no one selling jam. There's no one selling. Yeah, you know, there's some maybe someone selling bracelets, but they've got themselves on EP, paying themselves ten thousand a month, and probably going into debt either on paper or not. It doesn't matter. But yeah, it's it lo- That's where it hit the market quite a lot. So you've got a lot of trailing spouses with hobby business businesses that just disappeared. That was the real hurt in in the in, the, in Singapore anyway. So crazy, so crazy. <laughs> so, as far as like you touched earlier on the fact that being an extrovert is very advantageous when you're doing this trailing spouse thing and you're you're globe trotting or moving to different parts of your own country or when you when you're mobile. Mm. What do you think? the advice that you would give to people that are on the the flip side you said it can be quite challenging mm-hmm. for people that are introverted have you who like i'm sure you've come across plenty of introverts in your time that have actually seen sort of success in assimilating and whether it's through your sport or through the business network and those sorts of things like what what advice or what are things have you seen that have sort of really worked because I think that's a lot of feedback that I get offline from people they're like you're always you're always intro- interviewing mm-hmm. extroverts and I was like that's well, because none of the introverts want to do an interview with me <laughs> <laughs> well I'm actually I'm actually a bit of an introvert I'm an introvert extrovert they say so I'll an go extroverted home and I'll stay introvert. Home. yeah so I'll stay home on my own I need my own time so I'll, I'll stay home for like three days and hide away uh, if I and then I'll go out and do an event and I'll speak for a day or two and then I'll go back and hide away. So I can't do it full time. Uh, and my husband's totally introvert, um, so I get the introvertness. Uh, trust me. Um, but my biggest advice is to join pre-established networks. So you can go anywhere in Asia and there's, there'll be an answer, right? So we're, we're Australian, so uh, Australia New Zealand Association, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so ANZA, you know, they run Mahjong days, uh, they run social tennis days, they run uh, bingo, they run all different kinds of things. So join networks like that. Um, whereas then you've got a pool, they do coffee mornings. You've got a pool of automatic people that you can relate to because they're all Australian. So if you're Australian going in another country, join the Australian network. If you're a Brit joining another country, go to the British network. Um, so join a ne- an established social group um doesn't have to be sport um with people from your same country because then you've instantly got a connection say where are you from i'm from sydney where are you from i'm from perth okay great i've been to perth love perth and then you it's easy to be an extrovert or easier to have a chat when you've got something in common 
if you walk into a room with a bunch of Spanish people, if I walk into a room with a bunch of Spanish people and I'm not feeling my extrovertness that day, I'm going to go, oh, where are you from? They go, oh, Barcelona. I'm like, okay, cool. And that's it. I'm like, know nothing about Barcelona, know nothing about Spain, can't speak Spanish. I'm like, I like paella. Great. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> like, if you, you know what I mean? Like, so you don't really have anything in common. So, so find something that you like to do or like-minded people and join those things. So for me, it was sport. I like playing sport. I have a connection with sport people. Um, I'm Australian. I automatically join ANZA in both countries. In Hong, I did it in Hong Kong. I did it in Singapore. Go to a couple of coffee mornings. If you like the people, great. If you don't, no problem. But you'll get a little bit of a network that you've got a base. And then you build off that base. Because normally, so like I've met some people through ANZA. And, you know, I've met, so let's say, Kerry through ANZA. So I, hi, Kerry. And then Kerry goes, oh, I'm going out with some other friends of mine outside of ANZA, who she might have met through netball. And I don't play netball. So, you know, then I meet her netball friends. So, which are possibly Australian or not. But they have netball in common. So then I meet friends of friends of friends. So you kind of got to leverage and you do have to put yourself out there. As soon as you go to another country, you can't sit inside and hide away. And it's unfortunate for introverts because they will struggle. But if you join somewhere with a common interest, that is the number one suggestion I would give anyone moving outside. Yeah. That's That's great advice. (laughs) Just common interest. Then you got stuff to talk about. I met you, I didn't know you, and we just meet, and you're like, Aussie, Aussie, yep, great, and you have a chat. Yeah, but there's a lot of Aussies I meet that I don't like, so it's not that you're going to become best mates with every Aussie, so. I was about to say, because that's the same thing. (laughs) So you do have to filter some people. (laughs) Uh, I um, I think that that's a really good point, and I think that, Sport has always been a default for me as well, but that's not for everyone. And um, I think that's a really good point that you've made that a lot of those organisations will have other things, extracurricular activities Mm. that are not not sport related. Um, Is there anything that you wish that you had done prior to both the moves? So I'm going to put that on to you in two places. So prior to your move to Mm. Hong Kong as footloose and fancy free 28-year-old, and then mm-hmm. something that you could have prepared mm. or done differently for, between Hong Kong and Singapore? Interesting. For me, probably not. I mean, before I moved to Hong Kong, I'm a bit of, I have a bit of OCD. So so I, I got a map of Hong Kong like the size of the coffee table and I drew where my husband's work was where, and I just looked up. I had, back in those days, didn't even Google. I looked, I bought a book on Hong Kong and I looked at where to go in Hong Kong. So I was circling different things in Hong Kong. I wasn't even looking at sport in, in, in that and just looking, you know, where the supermarkets are, what supermarkets are there and things like that. So, so for me, I just got a massive map and I was like, okay, where do I want to live and what's near there? And then when I landed, so I, so I kind of knew the scale of it and where things were. And then when I landed, the very first thing I did in Hong Kong was localize myself. So you can move to another country and go in an expat bubble, as they say, and then you meet only expats and you only talk to expats and, you know, you live this expat world and blah, blah, blah. And, and I didn't want to do that. I, I've never done that. A- anywhere I go, like, or anywhere, I've only been two places, but I like to live locally. So when I landed in Hong Kong, I went straight to the wet market, which is like a hawker kind of like, you know, a local market. Um, I went straight to local squash centers, straight to local tennis centers, met local people, um, started learning the language, you know, kind of in, in, embraced the localness of it, embraced the culture, um, tried to learn. So I, w- I went to my husband's work um, and and, uh, and, st- and so his secretary used to take me to lunch and, you know, feed me uh, chicken's feed and all this kind of gross stuff and, and intestine and stuff and when I when I had a baby, she wanted to give me like this blood soup to replenish my blood and all this stuff, and it was great and I loved it. Like I didn't eat it, but I loved <laughs> that she wanted me to embrace the culture as well, so she could see that I wanted to learn about the culture. So I was lucky in in the fact that she wanted to teach me. So that was quite good. So so I'd probably yeah I did some study about where I'm going and and what to expect, but I tried to stay out of the expat bubble in the beginning and try to learn the culture because then 
for me, it was good because I got more respect. So when I, I learned the culture and I could speak Cantonese, you know, I'd get in a taxi or go for lunch and, and it was really cool because I could order food in, in Cantonese and people would start a conversation and then I'd talk back and they're like, wow, this is awesome. And then just random Chinese people you'd play golf with and they're like, oh, do you play sport? Yeah, play golf. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's go play golf. I'm like, okay, cool. So, you know, I wouldn't have had that if I stayed in the expat bubble. So especially Hong Kong, Singapore is different. Singapore, when I moved to Singapore, I didn't really look up anything. I didn't want to go to Singapore. Uh, and I didn't look up anything, didn't want to know any friends, didn't, I didn't want to borrow it. So I, I kind of did myself a disfavor in that way. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. I just moved here. Kids got into school, good schools. Uh, I got into playing some sport and I didn't want to work here. And I was just, you know, had a name here and then did some work in Hong Kong. So I didn't really explore. Uh, which I'm actually doing now. So uh, since COVID, trying to explore more local areas. But Singapore is a little bit like, I explained to people, it's like Australia in the 80s. So when I grew up, you know, you're playing cricket in the dead end street and you're tossing balls around with your friends and you dri- you're riding your bike to the supermarket and you're buying, you know, a bag of candy for $5 kind of thing. So that's what I explain. That's Singapore to me. So I've got a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old now safest place in the world <laughs> so i don't if the 17 can be out till two o'clock in the morning and i have no problem with that uh, i know there's no drugs here uh very little crime uh, and that back in the 80s that's what we all thought it probably was but we didn't see it <laughs> um so so it's quite a quite a kind of good now but uh yeah but i didn't do any research coming to singapore that uh okay so not I... much culture can I extrapolate some advice there is maybe when you're relocating to a new country, try not to have a extended tantrum about it? <laughs> yes, like a two-year tantrum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so have open eyes and, and embrace the culture. Go and go get localised. Don't, don't go straight into expat world because it's, it's easy to go into expat world mm. and then you never get out. Mm. So I would strongly suggest having local friends and expat friends. Mm. I love that. Oh, Emma, I think that's a beautiful spot to, to wrap us up. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing. That's hilarious. Cool. And I <laughs> I think if the one takeaway is to not have a tantrum before you relocate <laughs> is a great, a great piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be open-minded. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so cool. much for your time. It's all right. Thanks for having me. Have a good day.